We've dissected Stephen King's On Writing, John Gardner's The Art of Fiction, and Anne Lamott's Bird by Bird. And in each of those videos, I asked you for your favorite writing books, and there have been a handful of books that are recommended time and time again. One of the most requested books in the comments is The Story Grid, What Good Editors Know by Sean Coyne. Now, this is a book that I've always been aware of, I've always known of, but I've never picked it up. And so thank you to your recommendations on the past two videos because that's what finally made me read this book. If you have any other books on writing or storytelling that have helped you become a better writer, then share it below. This is one of my favorite kinds of videos to do and I hope that you like it as much as I do. If you wanna support this channel, like the video, subscribe for more content focused on helping you become a better, stronger storyteller. And if this book sounds like something that you'd like, pick it up using the link in the description and you can support this channel at no additional cost to you. So with a writing book that is so highly praised and so popular, I'm really excited going into this. And even looking at the cover, I know that this book will break down stories in terms that I align with. I mean, look at my past videos. Graphing out stories is how I wrap my head about what writing works. And it's how I look at my own stories to see where my own shortcomings are. And before we even break into this book, I have to point out something that is absolutely awesome about the story grid. Unlike Stephen King's book or the John Gardner's of the world, the story grid was written by Sean Coyne in 2015. And since then it's been expanded into more than just a book. You can actually check out the story grid YouTube channel run by author and marketing expert, Tim Grawl, that has put out more than 300 free high quality videos on improving your writing and your storytelling. Look, these are content creators, authors, and experts that you can readily access, communicate with, and follow. So don't miss out on a great resource. Okay, with that out of the way, let's focus on the book. Who is Sean Coins? At, at least at the time of the publishing of this book, Coins was an editor with 15 years of experience and a track record of 350 books and over 15 million copies sold. And he claimed that his method of working with a story was developed over his entire career, and he called it the story grid. This method focuses on accomplishing a few things, but none as important as helping a writer understand if their story needs improvement and identifying exactly what must be fixed. When you think about the role of an editor like Sean Coyne, this makes sense. It's tough to nail down the exact job description of an editor nowadays, but at its core, an editor helps an author take a story from good to great. In one of my more recent videos on creating strong character names, I asked you how you name your characters. An overwhelming response in the comments was that you go with your gut, which to be fair, that means you're using your intrinsic thought processes and decision making, but for Content creators focused on breaking down the process and going with your gut means nothing to someone who's looking for help. Trying to dissect what going with your gut means is the hard part for a channel like this one. Who knows if your guts are different? That sounds weird. And the reason I bring this up is that Coin is approaching this in the same way. What makes a story good? What makes a story work? Some people might reply that a story works because it feels right. Well, when you don't know how to make a story feel right and no one breaks it down beyond that, how can you really learn to improve your stories? And that's where the story grid comes in. It's Coin's attempt to expand on what makes a story feel right. The book starts with some context and stories from the author. These stories work to impart lessons to the reader, things like how big publishing houses are moving more and more commercially, uh, how the big seller books are the focus and not the next great American novelist, uh, or the basics for how a scene in your story needs to work. Now, a scene is a moment of change in your story. A scene should have some discernible beginning and end and result in some sort of change. And Coyne even says that creating scenes is the true talent and worth of a writer. Everything else, character journeys and conflict and resolutions can be learned. But a scene is a collection of storytelling beats that results in movement. Scenes are many stories. And I thought that was kind of a, a neat, quick takeaway. Coyne writes about how a scene 
needs to shift. Each scene works within your story by shifting the positive or the negative. And at its core, each scene within your book should go from positive to negative or negative to positive or push the character further in one direction. He calls this the scene turn. If a scene doesn't turn, then it's not a scene. So that's what a scene is, a component of a story. But Coin references all kinds of different components throughout this book. So let's make sure we at least understand them. First, we have the beat, an identifiable moment of a story. And if you were to summarize your story in incredible detail, a beat would be every single bullet point that you list out. A beat is a basic building block of a story. A sequence is a large stage in the global story. We'll hear more about that soon. And Coyne seems to consider sequences as a more advanced evolution of scenes. A sequence is a collection of scenes at a moment in time or location or purpose that combine into a larger overall experience. Larger than that of a sequence, is an act, and you've likely heard of three-act stories, five-act stories, even seven-act stories. It's a common enough topic discussed among storytelling. A theme that we've seen time and time again with Coin is that each of these smaller components of storytelling have all the elements of a story in themselves. And that's even more clear here with an act. At the conclusion of each act of your story, there should be a point of no return. There should be a reason that at the end of act one, our main character can't just turn around and leave the story. Subplots are adjacent storylines that highlight or contrast the overall theme of a story. They are not the highlight of your story or the purpose of your book, but they give the reader more to follow and invest in. A common way to add a subplot is to include a romance within your novel. You see it in just about every single story because it just works. It's also a shortcut to highlight the human elements of your characters in the midst of the main story chaos. These subplots function as entire stories, but they tend to have big moments that are also not fully present in the narrative. The reader can assume that the main character has had interactions with the love interest off page and that their relationship has grown. Lastly is the global story. This is the story. This is the full package. It's the full collection of your characters and the plot and the conflicts and the consequences. And this is the book that you hand to a friend or the movie that you put on at the end of the night. These are all components of the story and we'll see Coin talk about each of them as we move forward. And then before long, we're at genre. Now genre is a critical component to a story that works. First, genre communicates information to the reader before they even open up your book. It contains a long list of expectations and payoffs that the reader will expect to experience. If you advertise your story as one genre, and it doesn't meet the expectations of that genre audience, then your book will feel like it doesn't work to that audience. Coin actually goes as far to list the five major expectations an audience gets from the genre. It's time, reality, style, structure, and general content. We've actually discussed this on my channel in my second video. It was about tropes in writing. Genre carries a lot of information for the reader. In just about any literary genre, you can find these core tropes that a reader expects to encounter. That expectation influences how the reader will experience the book, meaning that a well-written book that doesn't meet those expectations may not be considered a well-written book. For examples of these tropes, I always like to look toward romance. The romance genre has evolved into embracing these genre expectations and even advertising books based on those expectations. Readers know that they really like the enemies to lovers trope or the forbidden love trope or the billionaire playboy trope. And because of this, readers within this genre search for books based on the tropes that they like and authors advertise their books in regards to their tropes. It's a set of expectations that everyone involved in is able to participate in. And Coyne continues this thought by stating that every genre also has a list of obligatory scenes. Romance novels have the first kiss. Mystery novels have the scene where the dead body is found. Every genre has these scenes at its core, these must-have moments for that kind of story. So zooming in 
to the, the content of your genre, Coyne brings us to our first coverage of plot. He mentions three kinds of plot. Mini plot, arch plot, and anti plot. Arch plot is the classical plot, the tried and true quest narrative, the hero's journey, however you want to phrase it. When you think of a story, this is the kind of story that comes to mind. The protagonist pursues something that they desire. They face some kind of opposition and they're changed by the resolution of the story. And this change requires challenge or conflict, loss, and some irreversible change to the world or the character. And if this change doesn't happen, then what's the point of the story? Now here, Coyne says that the arch plot has a single protagonist and is linear in the presentation of the story. In this way, it mirrors our own lives, making it a sort of universal human approach to a story. Coyne says that the arch plot is the approach to writing a story that provides you with the most audience because it's the most accepted and understood kind of story. Mini plot is another aspect of plot to consider and it has ties to more internal struggles than what we saw in the arch plot. This style of story moves the conflict from the world around our active driven character into the mind of a more passive character. Mini plot also allows the writer to experiment with an open ending or a non-linear story. Coyne says that each addition of these mini plot qualities that you add to your story lessens the overall audience who can connect with these stories. And at first, I don't know, I wasn't quite sure about that. I almost exclusively seek out these fantasy and science fiction books that are interesting and innovative and exciting to read. But then I realized that, of course, I'm not the general audience. And if you're watching this video, then you likely aren't the general audience in this kind of conversation. Think back to the kinds of books that you read when you were first discovering your love of reading. It was likely some big popular book or some trend or a recommendation by a family member or a friend. And it was likely a book full of the kind of arch plot qualities that Coined just mentioned before. Accessible, straightforward, and engaging. Your first fantasy book isn't Malazan Book of the Fallen. Your first science fiction book isn't A Fire Upon the Deep. Only as you build up the tolerance and love for the qualities of these mini plot stories, then you seek them out. The qualities that Coyne mentioned about mini plots, I would summarize as books that lean more into complex storytelling. Which then brings us to anti plot. Anti plot is the recognition of the arch plot and the purposeful breaking of those rules. Anti plot is the absurdity and surrealness of stories that just leaves you with reader whiplash. What the heck did I just read? Break the rules, create whatever you want. Anti plot is anti establishment. Think Kafka and the trial. Think 1984. Think Vonnegut. Writers who knew the rules of writing so well that they knew how to break them. The story grid builds itself upon the foundation of the arch plot and the mini plot, not so much the anti plot. Now that we understand the qualities of plot, let's look at the elements of plot. How do you use the story grid to create or analyze a plot that works? Coyne claims that the most modern storytelling can be distilled into something akin to the hero's journey. And that true journey of the story begins with some inciting incident. Now, Coyne uses the inciting incident, which can be something totally random or something that occurs to our character and introduces an object of desire. This could be the true thing that the character wants, like the Holy Grail, or something more intrinsic, like a character wanting to be closer to their father. Or in a well-planned story, it could be both. But choose these desires carefully for your story. Creating a situation where your character doesn't truly need or want something is kind of setting yourself up for failure. By introducing a storyline A, where our character pursues this thing, and a storyline B, where our character pursues this intrinsic goal, the author can create a much deeper story. We're all familiar with storyline A. Indiana Jones wants to find the Holy Grail. He has the notes and the maps needed to take the step towards the goal. He needs to solve mysteries and fight his way past villains. This kind of storytelling and conflicts and consequences is fairly easy for most people to figure out. Storyline B 
Indiana Jones connecting with his father is a much deeper story filled with internal and intrinsic conflict. Coyne goes as far to call this pairing of conflicts the heart and soul of a story. If you get stuck planning or writing your story and your conflicts don't seem right, ask yourself two questions. What does your character want and what does your character need? Coyne says that those external desires like the holy grail or money should be the things that your characters want and that those internal desires, connection with Indiana's father, is what your character needs. That genre, the reader expectation that we discussed before, also plays a role here. What your character wants, this external desire, is influenced by the genre of your story. An adventure story has a hero that wants to stop the villain. A romance story has a protagonist that wants to be with someone. A thriller novel, <laughs> a thriller novel has a protagonist that wants justice. Those are the external desires. The internal desires work a little differently. Now, this may work best with another example. In a thriller novel, the protagonist may be trying to find justice. That's the external desire. The internal desire may be his own justice and internal turmoil from a past failing. So within the story, he may choose to sacrifice himself to save someone more innocent than him as a way to redemption. That's the human element of the character, the internal struggles. And you might say that this character, this detective, was just doing his job. And maybe that's what the character himself would say, but imagine this. The internal desire is what a couple trips to the therapist would uncover beneath that statement. As an author, it's your job to create a story that pairs external desires and internal desires together in some satisfying way. They should work off of each other. Again, going back to Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, there is a specific moment where Indiana must choose between the grail and saving his father. And these desires, the external and the internal, are at odds with each other. Now, you may be thinking that this is too much. You just want to write a good story. But what we've learned in the past videos is that a good story is, at its root, a human story. No matter the setting or genre, it appeals to those basic human needs and emotions. Yes, we want to see James Bond save the world. Yes, we want to see Vin Diesel drive his car fast. Yes, we want to see Frodo destroy the ring, but we also want to see people overcome their past demons. We want to see people feel accepted and safe and protective of their families. We want to see a return to happiness when that happiness seems impossible. That's human, man. That's something that every story has in common. Okay, so that's all really good information, but the story grid is supposed to have these like actionable, useful takeaways, not just these bits of advice. That's like its whole thing. When do we get to the story grid? Well, first we have to get to something Coin calls the fool's cap method. A fool's cap is a legal pad. And so while it's a catchy name, you don't truly need a legal pad to use it. The fool's cap method is a way of breaking a story into, wait for it, three acts. Yes, we've covered plot frameworks before in these two videos, what makes the fool's cap different is the emphasis on limited space. And we'll get to that in a second. Quick important note here that isn't covered until much later in the book. The fool's cap method is a way of looking at your story from a distance. It's a 10,000 foot view of the story. The story grid covered later in this video is going to take you through your story with a fine toothed comb. You'll see what I mean. When using the fool's cap method, the first thing to do is to answer six questions. What is the genre? What are the obligatory scenes of that genre? What is the point of view? What are the objects of desire? What is your controlling idea or theme? And what is the beginning hook, middle build, and the payoff? Now, originally, the Fool's Cap method took the entire story and you had to use the space of a single page to plan your story out. And we've covered a lot of these six questions, but we haven't yet talked about theme or controlling idea. And Coyne says that this is always the hardest part to fill out. The theme here is what your story is really trying to say. And I think this is really interesting. In the past books that we've looked at, Stephen King and Lamott and John Gardner have all reiterated that theme should come after the story. 
You should create a story, find the theme, and then hone that theme through editing. Coin instead says that you should write your theme as part of this full scat method. Now he does say that the more that you write, the easier it is to build a story and identify the themes within. And then uh, there it is. If you don't have your theme down, it's not the end of the world, but Coin suggests that you consider the theme and the controlling idea because it can be a tool to help you direct your work when you feel lost. So if you're gonna put down a theme or controlling idea, what exactly should it say? Well, it should be short, concise, and directly related to the conflicts of your story. It doesn't need to be high and lofty or abstract or full of symbolism. The controlling idea here can be as simple as justice prevails overall, or as wild as narcissistic self-abuse annihilates all forms of human love. That's for Stephen King. Now, once you've laid out these meta details, then the fool's cap method has you actually plot out your story in those three acts. The first is called the hook, and then the build, and finally, the payoff. Within each of these acts, there are five parts, the inciting incidents, the progressive complications, crisis, climax, and resolution. More on the five commandments of storytelling later. With the story broken down like this, there should be at least 15 scenes in your book, three acts, five scenes in those. The total word count of the story should be broken into 25% for the hook, 50% of the story for the build, and 25% of the story for the payoff. Each scene should be about 2,000 words, what Coin calls potato chip length. That's small enough for someone to convince themselves to read one more chapter before bed and addictive enough that you might keep doing it all night. Now you may have noticed 15 scenes, 2,000 words a scene is only a 30,000 word book. Modern books are between 80,000 and 100,000 words. And that means we have a lot of extra ground to cover. And this is where your artistry comes in. With your critical scenes mapped out and the obligatory scenes that your genre requires, it's now up to you to add the scenes to build out your story. However, the core components of your story should be fully present within those 15 scenes of the Fool's Cap Method. And that can tell your full narrative of your book. Let's talk inciting incidents. Coin calls this the first commandment of storytelling. The big inciting incident kicks off your story and smaller inciting incidents kick off your other acts. And even smaller ones can kick off a sequence of your book. Inciting incidents happen in two ways. There's causal inciting incidents that are the result of some action, like a character enlisting in a military or a murder happening. And coincidental inciting incidents are the result of randomness. What I find more interesting than Coyne's idea of these kinds of inciting incidents, is that he says that inciting incidents are often one of those obligatory scenes that the genres require. The inciting incident of a genre also typically leads to an obligatory climax for the genre. A murder mystery starts with the body and ends with solving the crime. Hopefully this shows you how important these inciting incidents are. It may be so important that you plan out your inciting incident and the payoff before you even start writing. But overall, the best advice that Coin gives here in regards to inciting incidents is to put them in each act. You could even be so granular that each scene has some form of inciting incident. Whatever the case may be, mix them up between those causal and coincidental inciting incidents. Now between the inciting incident and your climax, a lot needs to happen in your story. One of the important focal points is the turning point. A turn can happen in regards to any scope of your story, a turning point of a scene, of a sequence, or of your global story. It's where everything changes. And usually it comes in two methods, character action or revelation. Character action is when the character decides to finally stop being passive and to take matters in their own hands. Revelation is when someone reveals a bit of information to our detective that puts everything into place. So why is this important? The turning point is what makes a reader keep flipping the page. Creating a story that alternates between character action turns and revelation turns is how you create a dynamic and addictive story. If your story feels like it just isn't engaging enough or exciting enough, the cause may lie with the lack of turns throughout your story. Now, crisis follows the turn and it's the reaction of your characters to the turn. Your character must respond to this turn in some way. 
We as readers want to see the characters make hard choices, which means that the crisis that appears in your stories and scenes must have weight to them. The crisis confronted by your characters must raise in intensity. The crisis that your characters face in the first act of the book should not be more dramatic and intense than the crisis presented at the climax of your story. Now, Coyne keeps bringing up a few words that are really interesting to me, and he's done this throughout much of his book. It's this idea of moments of no return. Moments that are reversible are drastically different than moments that are irreversible. Consider that in the planning of your book. What moments of conflict and consequences are reversible and therefore less serious? And what moments of conflict and consequences are irreversible? And that's one way to raise the stakes. This also brings to mind something that John Gardner said in his book, The Art of Fiction. He mentions that tension within writing partly comes from the actions of your characters, yes, but mostly comes from the audience understanding the consequences of a decision that the characters are making. And this plays well with the idea of an irreversible decision. When writing, create conflict in a way where the audience knows what is at stake if the character chooses a bad decision. Craft a situation where there are only bad choices for the character and make the audience aware of that information before the character makes their choice. It's like a train wreck that you can't look away from. And that brings us to the climax. The climax is the precise moment of your story where everything culminates to a head. We've seen the inciting incidents. We've watched the characters fumble through the story. We've seen the turning point and the crisis. And finally, it's time for action. Some people would argue that the climax of a story is the whole reason for the story's existence. Failing to nail the climax is failing to tell your story. No pressure. Just like inciting incidents and crisis and turning points, there are also multiple climaxes that the reader encounters through your story. Don't laugh. There is no good way to phrase that line. The, there needs to be an increase in intensity, stop laughing, and culminate into a big moment at the end of your story. Really, stop laughing. You know, with how much detail was covered in things like inciting incidents and crisis, I was really let down by the little amount of detail that Coyne brings in on this topic. He spends the majority of this chapter looking at climaxes from Silence of the Lambs, which is quoted dozens of times throughout this book, and doesn't provide nearly the same amount of information as the other topics. The biggest takeaway here that I came out with is that your character at the beginning of the novel should react to the climax in an entirely different way than your character reacts at the end of the novel. We wanna know that there has been this big change. We as readers need to see and understand the change that the story has had on the character. He finished the commandments by introducing the concept of resolutions. A story without a resolution is like dinner without dessert. Yes, you may still be satisfied, but you could have been so much more satisfied with something sweet at the end. The story doesn't end at the conclusion of the climax. The reader deserves to see the world and the characters after everything has changed. Ah, all right, at this point in the story grid, we now have all the information we need to actually use the framework. Remember, this is not a framework to plan a story, but to edit a story. It's a framework to identify the strengths and weaknesses of your story, to trim the fat and emphasize the true meat of the story. The final 25% of this book is a very thorough analysis of Silence of the Lambs by Thomas Harris. Coyne has referenced this book in all of his examples and also has this story completely diagrammed out through the story grid and you can access it online through the links below. The story grid breaks the story into acts and scenes and marks each scene for what kind of change happened. Remember, every scene needs to employ some positive or negative change. It also identifies the turning point of the scene. Doing this helps you identify if some scenes are too long or short or need refining. Coin even goes so far as to identify the length of time, the duration that each scene is supposed to take in the story. Yes, it's very in depth. I highly recommend that you read through this book. I think that it gives you a lot to think about as a writer and it prepares you to write with a little bit more intentionality. And that's a big takeaway in all of my videos. Instead of saying that a story feels good or feels bad, instead of saying that you name your characters with your gut, 
Instead of saying that it just happens like it's some kind of magical phenomenon that flows through you, let's try to put those processes to the test. Let's define them and give writers more to think about. Writing isn't magic. There really is a methodology behind great writing and it's up to us to try to figure that out and apply it to what we write. I think that the story grid is best used in your own editing phase to better understand your story. I just finished the second draft of my upcoming novella, Starlight Farms Kennel for Talking Dogs, and reading through the story grid gave me a lot to think about when it comes to tightening up that draft. I'll likely go through and try this story grid out myself, at least to the best of my meager abilities. I hope that you find this video helpful. It gave me a lot to think about, and I really like the way that Sean Coyne thinks about writing and expresses those ideas. Remember to go check out the Story Grid YouTube channel for more content about writing. Personally, I think this book just psyoped me into wanting to read Silence of the Lambs, so I'm gonna go do that. As always, as always, thank you for watching.